When I was eight years old, I used to pull the blanket up to my chin and lay quietly in the dark, just listening. My sister was already asleep in the small twin bed across from mine, so she didn't have to hear them fighting. Mom would say something in a soft voice, and then Dad would attack with a barrage of angry words. It doesn't matter what you think. None of that matters because I'm the head of the household, and you need to respect my authority. His yelling would go on for a while, and then she would try to say something in between sobs, but it would be immediately shut down by more yelling. After the nights when they fought, Mom would be particularly quiet the next day. I could walk into the kitchen barefooted, and she wouldn't tell me to put on socks. She wouldn't remind me how those stone tiles could make me sick. There's oatmeal on the stove, she'd say with her back turned. But I hadn't really come upstairs for the oatmeal. After making sure that she heard me open a cabinet and pull out a bowl, I asked her about the fight. Mom, why was Dad yelling? But what I really wanted to know was, is that normal? Is that how marriage is supposed to be? Nothing, sweetie. She proceeded to pop the cap off a highlighter and run it across a page in front of her. She taught a weekly Bible study, and nearly every morning before my other three siblings woke up, I would see her reading and studying at the kitchen table. Nothing, sweetie. This answer was supposed to derail my investigation before it had even begun, but I hated being stuck in a state of curiosity. It was like walking around all day with a nagging itch that I couldn't quite reach. I bravely claimed the seat next to hers at the table, setting down my bowl of warm oatmeal. Well, is everything going to be okay between you and Dad? I quickly would look down and stir the oatmeal with my spoon. After some prying, she would always give me the same answer, and it always had to do with the Bible. The Bible says the man has authority over the woman. The Bible says the wife has to submit to her husband. The Bible says divorce is not allowed, ever, and that sex before marriage is a gigantic sin. Your dad and I didn't even kiss before we were married, my mom would proudly say. At some point, I decided that I never wanted to get married. Around the same time, I also decided that there must have been some mistake with my birth, because apparently it was much better to be born a boy. When I saw the original Star Wars movies for the first time, I wanted my hair to be short like Luke Skywalker's. After a lot of nagging, my mom cut it all off, probably because she realized that if she hadn't done it, I would have chopped it off myself. One by one, shirts from my brother's closets were snuck into mine. My mom would bring all four of us kids to the grocery store, and like baby ducks, we would follow her around, wide-eyed, me wearing boys' clothes and proudly gloating over the fact that I didn't have to be a girl anymore. I didn't have to subject myself to a life that consisted only of cooking and cleaning the house. I didn't have to obey and submit and cry every night after being yelled at by a controlling husband. Boys got to play outside, fight with sticks, and build forts in the woods, and when it was hot, they got to take their shirts off. I never owned a doll, and although I had quite a collection of stuffed animals, I began occasionally ripping their heads off when I was really upset about something, particularly Sundays. I could be a boy every day of the week, except for Sundays. Arms crossed, I would sit on the floor in my room until Dad would come in there with a wooden spoon. Time to get dressed for church. Now. Mom had already chosen a dress and laid it neatly on my bed. All I needed to do was put it on. But it wasn't just the dress I was putting on. It was a female identity. It was every single female role that I'd grown to despise. In a dress, I was supposed to know how to cook. In a dress, I was supposed to obey men. In a dress, I was supposed to be in quiet servitude for the rest of my life. Soon, I figured out that if I wore pants underneath the dress, then I could at least keep a fraction of my dignity intact. After church, I would run to the car and rip off that dress leaving it crumpled in a scornful heap on the back seat of the van. Then I would sprint back inside the church building, just so that everyone could see me in pants. When I first started puberty at 14, I was horrified. Mom, they can go away, can't they? I asked, pointing to my chest. Nearly in tears. I don't want them. How do I make them go away? I resorted to taking an ace bandage and wrapping it tightly around my upper body, which sort of worked. I could still wear boys' clothes, I just couldn't take my shirt off when it was hot outside. My constant hysteria of trying to deal with these bodily changes did not go unnoticed by my brother Nick. He was a terror to all of my siblings. He would lock my sister Grace outside the house when my parents weren't home, and he would kick Joe in the balls for fun. But to get to me, he had started calling me Young Lady. 
More particularly, when we were in a fight, he would say, Now you listen here, young lady. The more my body changed, the harder I fought. I wasn't exactly a boy anymore, but I didn't want to be a young lady either. My mom would always stare at herself in the mirror, turning around to check every angle, and she would mention how fat she looked. She would pinch the bulging bundle of lumpy skin above her waist and wave it at me. See this? This is what happened to me after I had you guys. These physical changes were happening without my permission. They were propelling me closer and closer to a life that I didn't want, and I started loathing my body for it. I watched with a sense of dread as my mom spent her entire day preparing meals for the family. I watched as she endlessly shoved piles of laundry into the washer and then the dryer and folded every piece. I watched as she mopped the floors with a sense of futility, knowing that by tomorrow they would be dirty again. My mother was a woman, but she had at some point been a girl who then morphed into this creature with curves and extra fat and an uncom uncomfortable monthly period. Her body had determined her fate. At least that's how it seemed to me at the time. From that moment, I hated my body. I hated what it was trying to turn me into. I declined to give it food when it wanted. I made it go thirsty. I sliced into it with a blade. I started referring to myself as stupid, worthless, disgusting. My world became entirely withdrawn and I lost interest in friendships because I projected my ideas about myself onto them and assumed they saw me the same way. I'd lost a noticeable amount of weight and was elated that my period had also stopped altogether. This fueled my efforts even more. My parents sent me to different counselors and recovery centers, but I wasn't about to let anything anyone said change my mind. Inside, there was a silent rage towards them, because if I were to recover, if I were to gain the weight back, I would be once again on track to falling into that oppressive female role. My parents gave me an ultimatum. Either take the prescription drugs that were being given to me by the psychiatrist, or move out. So, right after turning 18, I left home. For the next eight years, I actively struggled with body issues, and I say actively struggled because those were merely the years it physically took over my entire life. For the remainder of the years, it simply rested in the background like a coiled snake, ready to jump forward at the slightest trigger. Here's a brief synopsis of those eight years. Every day, I shoved my finger down my throat and threw my food up, at least once, if not more. Every single day, I counted the calories in each morsel of food that entered my mouth. Every day, I pinched parts of my body and agonized at how large they were, how womanly they were. Every day, I found it difficult to shower because it would involve glimpsing my naked female body in a mirror. Every day, I hated and loathed myself because I was female and because of what female represented. I naturally ended up in an abusive relationship where he valued me as little as I did, but what more could be expected? Now, today, am I better? Sure, I, I guess so. I don't have an active eating disorder. I'm no longer in an abusive relationship. But is this issue solved? Not at all. Today, we insult men by calling them girls. You're such a pussy. Stop acting like a girl. Today, women receive less pay than men for doing the same job. Today, women are seen as less valuable by employers because they might one day decide to have a child and need time off. Today, although women make up 50% of the population, they only occupy about 13% of leadership positions in politics. Today, we plaster pictures of sexualized half-naked women on magazine covers. And today, seeing a woman's breasts or butt in a movie is normal. It's common. Today, women's bodies are still treated like sexual objects, and they're judged simply on account of being female. How big are her boobs? How small is her waist? Oh, check out her ass. We often hear stories about rapists blaming the woman, saying that she tempted or teased him, that she led him on. Even while saying nothing at all, women's bodies are assumed to be speaking a sexualized language entirely of their own. Why is this okay? It was only in 1920 that women were finally allowed to vote, because up till that point, they were described as being mentally inferior to men. However, it wasn't until 1870 that the first woman in the U.S. was even permitted to go to school. How can we tell someone they're not allowed an education 
and then turn around and criticize them for being uneducated. Throughout history, women have been victims of a patriarchal society in which their value has been placed on their bodies, on their sexuality, rather than on the betterment of mental faculties and the importance of education. In the world, each year, 15 million girls are still married before the age of 18. They're traded like slaves to an oftentimes much older man and forced to have sex and bear children when they're still children themselves. There are over 20 prominent nations that still prevent women from receiving an education. Every 62 minutes in the United States, someone dies as a direct result from an eating disorder. Out of all the mental health issues, eating disorders are reported to have the highest mortality rate. A study by the National Association of Anorexia Nervosa and Associated Disorders reported that 18 to 20 percent of anorexics will be dead after 20 years, and only 30 to 40 percent ever fully recover. The mortality rate associated with eating disorders is 12 times higher than the death rate of all causes of death for females aged 14 to 24. 50% of girls between the ages 11 and 13 reportedly see themselves as overweight, and 80% of 13-year-olds have attempted to lose weight. These statistics shouldn't exist. This should never have become an acceptable cause of death, but it will continue unnecessarily claiming lives until we as a society take personal responsibility for it. It is our job to stop buying magazines that sexualize women's bodies and sell them for profit. It is our job to stop watching pornographic videos that include someone's daughter, someone's sister, someone's mother. It is our job to fill our daughter's heads with dreams instead of limitations, with possibilities instead of restrictions. It is our job to stop allowing the marriage of females who are mere children. We need to stop buying and selling sex in our music, and in our movies, and in our entertainment. You vote with your dollar. You vote with your support. The current system, as it is, will not crumble until we stop propping it up. We have already lost enough. One life lost as a result of this is too many. Every day, you play a part. Every day, you can either choose to add to those statistics or not. Every day, every moment, please choose no.